So what we're going to do now, first, we will try to define uh, gender as it is used in the paper, give you again a brief summer, uh, summary of the paper, try to give you also a bit of additional literature, then dive into critiques and comments we have on the paper, and then we'll try to spark a discussion. Okay, so before we go into uh, the summary of the paper, uh, I thought it would be good to define gender as it is uh, used in a paper, just so that we're all on the same page. So uh, gender is seen as something that is socially constructed. Uh, we have socially constructed roles or behaviors or power positions. And these are then mapped onto normative identity categories. Um, the paper especially uses the masculine and the feminine. Um, gender is also institutionalized through uh, repeated everyday behavior and interactions between people. Uh, it is also historically and demographically uh, specific, and uh, it is made functional within society uh, through, um, for example, behavior sanctioning. Um, the last point is also important. Uh, gender is uh, dependent on the intersection with uh, other identity markers. So, um, Professor Schneemann already talked a lot about that, so I'll try to be brief. But uh, she identifies and builds on uh, a concept used by Nelson in 1995 and identifies different elements of the discipline. Um, for example, personnel, as we've heard, there's a great um, underrepresentation of women, the leaky pipeline that was already explained by our uh, presenter. And also, which is really important, why this underrepresentation is crucial, because as authors like me have all had found, um, female and male economists tend to have different views on economic policy on economic theory and that's that that of course then matters when uh, we have this underrepresentation this also of course accounts for other intersectionalities and not just to uh, for female and male uh, second point is again publication practices uh, here authors like Dr. Al, for example found there is this grave uh, um, research output difference between male and female researchers and also Hengel for example finds that you have this grave underrepresentation of women in the top five journals. And authors have also argued, as we have heard before, that uh, women are held to higher standards regarding readability of the papers. But interestingly, they also find that once a paper is accepted, they tend to be cited more often than male authored papers. And also, women also receive less credit when it comes to co authored work, which again, of course, then impacts their chances for promotion. Uh, this already brings me to the gender promotion gap, which then again influences the leaky pipeline that we heard about before. Um, because authors find like uh, that women are less likely to receive tenure in economics than in other disciplines, for example, and receiving full professors even harder. And to give you an example, Gambit et al, for example, find that the promotion rate of women is around 80% of that in males for economics. Uh, then, um, the aspect of culture and environment. This whole discussion was started by the bachelor thesis of Wu in 2018, when she analyzed the wording that was used to describe female economists um, on this website called Economics Job Market Illness. And interestingly, or shockingly, she found that uh, posts that were characterized as female contained on average 43% less professional academic terms. But on the other hand, 192% more terms about personal uh, information or physical attributes than um, posts that were characterized as males. Uh, in the aftermath of that, the AEA also conducted a study um, about this climate and almost half of the female members have reported to at least once not have voiced an opinion or in question in the fear of harassment or unfair or disrespectful treatment. And uh, to stay tuned, we'll come back to that in the discussion because we think this whole environment and culture and economics is something that is crucial and is also present in our everyday life. Um, I think one also very interesting uh, part of this uh, of the article by Professor Schneebaum is the data. Um, as she has already explained a lot uh, of what she did there, I'm not going to go into detail there anymore, but I think this is an amazing point because as, as we have heard economics, especially nowadays, we see this empirical turn, we see it in mainstream, but I would argue we also see it in more heterodox um, aspects that people take you simply more seriously if you have data. So, but if the data is already biased, we have to also take that into account. 
well, to the uh, next section is the contemporary examples of gender matters. First off, is the topics. I mean, like economy has uh, has shifted the year. The topic researcher from being um, everyday life to everything. I mean, to research about everything. But gender is an important research topic for economics. Well, uh, there is a there was a research about the content of abstract in different uh, in the top five journals of economy from 1965 to. Uh, 2010 and the difference was that before the 19 the 70s there was no abstract i mean almost nearly to zero that they mentioned words like gender sex and women so i think like uh, and nowadays i mean that topic i mean that percentage has uh, barely changed because it's almost like nearly three percent of those abstracts that only contain those words in the next in the pedagogy that also that uh, professor schnauban has mentioned i mean it's important given that what is taught to us in our in the classes shape the world the way we see the world for example the overrepresentation of men in undergraduate program i mean like um there's a that Professor Schnaubank also mentioned that there is an overrepresentation in undergraduate programs, but there are some, some drivers that they um, propel that some that women prefer not to enroll usually to those type of programs because they consider that in some cases they don't have like the so, uh, there is a scarce of women that they are uh, women that they are in the role of being uh, the figure in economic uh, in economic discipline, and also because that gap between uh, in the undergraduate program is increasing year by year, and this address this topic was addressed by Paredes uh, Passerman um, in uh, in a Chilean universities, and just to also the content of classes according to Ban, uh, to Barzac and Start and Salt, they consider that in most cases economic classes uh, they tend to only mention uh, topics that are more interested of men. In that cases, there is a division like men are more comfortable to topics that are more related to math to mathematics and women are more prone to research and prefer topics related to welfare, inequality, uh, distribution and more stuff like that. And just to finally that section also regarding to models, the content of book use in economic classes. Also the professor Schnellman mentioned that uh, uh, one of the books of Norhaus and Samuelson, but also in the main books on the academic in the economic undergraduate programs, there is kind of bias because most of them when they try to mention the topic is regarding uh, gender, they only dedicate a few chapters, or and if they, they do that, well, it's only just like an intersectionality with labor, uh, gender, labor force, and this uh, inequality and, and distribution. Thank you. Okay, we will now turn to the points of critique. Uh, this is generally something that we felt was lacking, uh, but or could have been more in depth. Uh, right, I will go through them one by one, starting with the first, which is uh, the lacking scrutiny of ontological commitments in mainstream economics. Um, as has been highlighted uh, mostly by heterodox economists, there currently is a need to examine the ontological commitments in mainstream economics. Um, a quick definition, so ontology uh, refers to what actually exists. Uh, it's the question of what uh, the primary entities uh, of uh, concern are in any given field, what their general features are, and also what relationship uh, exists between those entities. And uh, within mainstream economics, uh, we generally focus uh, or consider methodology and discuss uh, the methods that we use and rarely uh, think about the uh, ontological commitments behind our study. Um, and we think that the paper could have benefited if it were also to include those ontological commitments and uh, how the production of knowledge uh, builds on that ontology used in mainstream economics. Um, this was also very apparent in the paper's critique of uh, GDP and how GDP is used as the main measure uh, within mainstream economics. Um, so for example, other feminist scholars uh, focus on or study the separation and the structure of the separation between the productive and the reproductive spheres and problematize this uh, ontological um, 
framework and also not only that it is a binary but also that we have a hierarchical dominance of the market activities over the non-market activities and um, this uh, view could have also been expressed within the paper and it would have made the argumentation maybe a bit stronger um, the second point is pretty straightforward uh, we felt like there was a bit of a lack of practical outlook uh, or something that we would have wished for were uh, concrete policy recommendations. Um, the third point of critique is uh, the limited elaboration on intersectional analysis and also the inclusion of decolonial perspectives. Um, the paper does acknowledge the intersectionality and the importance of uh, intersectionality within an analysis, but uh, we felt like it could have also went into more uh, in depth or concrete concrete examples. Um, yeah. Well, also, why is important to include global south and the colonial perspective? I mean, like the uh, according to the paper, if uh, it was based on feminism, black feminism, feminism and science, and science, and also that they highlighted the factor that intersectionality is important for gender, that which is a really good point. However, I mean, and also just uh, just bringing the part of a strong objectivity that mentioned Harding. I mean, like to just to to produce a strong productivity, a, a, a strong, uh, sorry, a strong um, a, a objectivity, sorry, a strong objectivity, it's important to consider the perspective of other authors in, and other visions in order just to have a better perspective in economy, to produce knowledge in the case, especially when it comes to economics. However, we consider that also when it comes to feminism, there are another perspectives that they were not considered, like the case of uh, feminism from the global south and feminism also from the colonial. Uh, because, I mean, like, there is also a difference. I mean, some authors that Haraway, Dangler, and C. C. Baker, they consider that feminist standpoint is shaped by our society, society, society standpoint. standpoint. Uh, so I think, like, for example, there is, like, a, the way uh, Cara thinks is not the way that I am think. So I think, like, it also tend to be biased. So in the end, it is important to also consider all those efforts. So in order to avoid that, uh, is that uh, objective, I mean, to create more objective uh, knowledge in economic, it's important to consider others' visions. So also, I mean, like from the offer that uh, the the actors that I mentioned also, but also if we want a broader uh, feminism include to, in economics also may, uh, may be going uh, far also in the case of the LGTB community. Well, thank you. Um, so here just a bit, a few things we thought would be interesting to discuss with you to spark a discussion. Uh, almost two years ago now, a dear colleague of mine, Judith Walter, started a project about classroom participation in economic classes. So we can also talk about uh, the culture in economics and how it is even present in uh, our classes here. And this is just to give you an idea so you get a feeling for the data. This is from Berlin from last year, and it's a very classical macroeconomics class. And the red line uh, corresponds to cis males. And as you can see, they, uh, even in clarification questions, they dominated each of the observed classes. We also see the same when it comes to statements or opinionated questions that we don't really have a data point where actually um, Flinter said more than uh, cis male. Um, I'm happy to explain this in more depth, but since it's not a focus, just to spark your ideas maybe on that. Uh, we also composed three discussion questions that we would like to discuss with you, but also with Professor Schneeba. The first one is, what are your experiences with gender bias in economics? Uh, and that connects to the graphs I just shown you. Um, have you ever experienced a, uh, a gendered uh, culture and environment economics or in conferences or in classes? Um, and the last point is also basically uh, what we also critiqued or it's basically what I will wish it to you, Professor Schneeber, do you think there's, what could we do uh, to reduce this gender bias, maybe on a uh, university level, as a on a professor's level, but also what we as students maybe could do? So thank you very much again for your talk, and we're looking forward here. Can you, just a few references. Thank you.
Uh, Alyssa, uh, David just said that you uh, um, can take the floor. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, thanks so much for this. Um, can one of you please send me these slides? I was taking pictures, but I, it would be easier if there are slides. Um, Elizabeth and Kara, uh, I'm super proud of you. I couldn't help but think I trained you well. <laughs> nice to see you again. Um, great job. Thank you really for the comments. I agree with pretty much everything you said. Um, especially the decolonializing economics. I mean, I tried to, like, I think that the point that matters the most here is what I said that, like, what I'm offering here is a kind of starting point. It's a framework. You can take this, and there is this deco decolonizing economics group, mostly in London. Um, you can take this framework and, and analyze the discipline of economics or any discipline from that point of view. Um, and, and I think that that's obviously a worthwhile um, endeavor in the paper. I tried to highlight papers who have addressed the kind of race-based issues in economics. Um, but yeah, of course, there's always more to be done. Um, I, I wanna hear your discussion, but the first thing that comes to mind when you ask me, what can you as students do to help make economics better is, um, I hope that this is not too dissatisfying for you, but it's it's really keep doing what you're doing. <laughs> your presence in economics, you're asking the questions, you're doing your great work, um, you know, writing interesting papers and asking interesting new new questions. I mean, like the the thesis from Judith, you mentioned Judith, and I, I was the um, I advised her thesis. I mean, it's super cutting edge. And that kind of work has to be done. And I'm going to work with her to get that work published. And, and I think the thing is to just persevere and keep doing it. And even though it kind of sucks, <laughs> you you or a lot of the discipline sucks or whatever, you stick with it, you keep doing your thing for as long as it you know works well for you. Okay, but now I'd love to hear what other people have to say. Questions from the, the audience. And maybe you could stop sh uh, sharing the slides so that I could at least see the room. Yeah, I don't see the room anyway. Okay. Yeah. Look for my question. I wrote it down so that I don't forget it. Um, am I audible? Yeah, yeah, I can also see myself. Sorry. <laughs> uh, but I had just a question on. Yeah, my name is Yaksh. Uh, I'm from India, and I identify as a cis male. And um, I had two questions. I wrote them down, but I forgot one of them. Uh, but one of them was about when we look at uh, when you say on average opinions differ among men and women. Um, it's just a question on methodology because we also saw data on how um, the representation of women is also small in the larger population. So when you yeah. say on average. Uh, so uh, because... so let, let me just answer real quick because it's easy. It's an easy answer question to answer. So these authors of that paper, inter, uh, sorry, did a survey of members of the American Economic Association. So they got the email list of everybody who had signed up as a member of that organization, and they sent a link to a survey, and they had people fill out the survey. Okay. So they're economists, um, not not you know anybody, but legal like formally trained economists. Okay. Yes. Well, that kind of makes more sense. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Um, Is there someone else? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Oh, this is really weird. <laughs> Hello, uh, I'm Linda from the Netherlands. I think I want to share partly with the class that I've been struggling quite a bit uh, with expressing myself in classes. Um, because I feel like I have to 
overcome so many self-doubts before I even raise my hand and then most of the time there's also already a lot of other people who are speaking and it's very difficult to come uh, in between and then whenever I do push myself which takes a lot of energy I feel like I have been socialized so much to take up little space that even if I have a question I tend to ask it super fast and not take my time to explain it uh, compared to other people who are more comfortable with taking space to express themselves. And I wonder at what point, like, do you have examples of students who have somehow self-organized to re-socialize themselves? Because I want to feel more entitled to speak, um, but I'm getting quite exhausted doing it by myself in a classroom. So I would like to collectivize it somehow. And I'm wondering if you have any examples. That's so great. Thank you for sharing your experience, Linda. Um, I, I just want to share also, it's not just you. I mean, I teach a lot of different types of economics classes. And me, as a, as a, I guess, still, you could say, like, female presenting person and, like, doing feminist stuff, still, it's mostly masculine presenting people who speak in my classes. Um, and more than half of the time when a woman starts to speak, she starts what she says with, sorry, but I just have a question. Observe, like, observe it in, in other rooms. It's, it's remarkable. Um, what really does help, or at least it helped me as a student, is um, being in a peer group, like you're suggesting, where you can talk about these issues and just knowing that you're not alone with it because you're not. Um, can be very, very helpful. And also having that kind of personal exchange in one of these peer groups, talking about exactly that issue, that the next time you're in a classroom and you see the same things happening, it feels a little bit different because it feels looser, because it's it's not just you and it's not this big, huge thing that you know, you're fighting against alone. So I think it's your suggestion is exactly what I, I would encourage you to pursue. Thank you. Hello. Uh, my name is Pranandita. I'm from India. I don't have a question. I also, as a woman who speaks a lot, I would like to share my experience if that's okay. And respond to Linda. Yeah, I um, have uh, my experience. So one of the questions was your experiences of gender in in your studies. So as an undergrad, I did physics. And in my class, we had 33 men and two women, of which I was one. And we had gender segregated housing. So the two of us, we were left out of group study sessions. We were even left out of drinking alcohol because alcohol was banned on campus. So you could only, it was a thing in, in the men's hostels. And I think a number of factors, but definitely this was one and I stopped talking in class, also because I was not very interested in physics. Um, when I came to Europe, it's I think it makes a lot of difference that we are not systematically segregated. And about, again, I see in this class, it's almost 50-50 men to women, and yet women speak a lot less. I was in at WU in my first year, and it was, I think, two-third women in my class. Um, and at a point, I just felt like this is too easy for me now. More women than men. It's, yeah. Um, but uh, I did attend one reading group voluntar uh, voluntarily, and it was on, on finance, on the history, on a very masculine topic. And it had, uh, it was again, very few women, unlike in my, in my seat class, in my ecological economics class. And what I realized that after so many years, it doesn't make any difference. I mean, I was the only woman talking in class, but almost nobody else. I think I remember one other time when another woman, another woman spoke. And um, but I see that even among the men, a very small fraction of people speak anyway. But I think it just to respond to Linda, after so many years, my personal journey, it does not make a difference. And I think that it's I personally feel like it is. Um, it's a good thing to accept that you are the least knowledgeable person in class because then you don't feel bad about asking stupid questions. So I have not collectivized, but if I start with, sorry, but I don't understand, I think that's um, 
that gives me more confidence. So interesting. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Hello, uh, I'm Bianca. I'm from Germany. I have two questions. Um, so first of all, um, from purely anecdotal evidence, uh, not quantified whatsoever. I have a feeling that if we look at class participation, it seems that, uh, I mean, I recognize that there is a um, strong difference between men and women participating in class. But what I also feel like I observe is the people that actually participate a lot in class seem to be the same people over and over. Um, and so I'm wondering how much of this par different participation rates how much of that is caused by societal factors so maybe which topics we talk about what is the um what is the amount of uh i don't know uh, if there is a female speaker or a male speaker and things like that and how much also has to do with um the distribution at the extremes because i feel like if we look at people who participate a lot in class are usually people that i don't know uh have uh, some I don't I, I don't know but there are probably some characteristics that you would find in people that participate a lot in class like being more confident or having more things to say mm -hmm. about the topic I don't really know uh, and how much does that have to do um, with just being an extreme that in these extremes you find more men than women this yeah. is one question I have another question but maybe I should wait for you to answer the first one uh, that would be helpful. Thanks. And I, and I do have to say, um, before I answer that and respond to the previous comment, um, I I have like at most seven minutes, but I really encourage you all to go on talking about this amongst uh, each other. So let me just respond to um, your classmates' comment that it doesn't matter if you speak or not. I I totally respect that, that perception, that um, point of view. Um, but I have to say from where I'm sitting as a person, as much as I don't like, you know, hierarchy and all of that, from where I'm sitting as the person with power who gives grades and writes recommendation letters, it matters a lot. And the person who's networked to institutions where I know about jobs being posted before many students do, it matters a lot. Because in a group of 30 people, if five people speak regularly, those are the people I remember. So it does matter. And it's it's that is systematic bias against introverts. I know. Um, and I try to work against that. And I read my students' papers and and then. Um, but uh, I think it does matter, actually. Um, and so, you know, when you when you start, you know, whatever job you do, whatever, you can argue that it doesn't matter, but uh, from my perspective. I think it does um, in this system that we have. Also starting with, sorry, I have a question um, or sorry, I didn't get that. I understand that it makes me more comfortable, but there is a gender bias there. Men don't say, sorry, I didn't get that. Or like masculine socialized people don't say that. So it, it kind of like sets you up to be positioned as, you know, in a, in a different place. So to this question now of um, how much is societal influence and the difference at the extremes of over-participating, I think, of course, of research in behavioral economics and experimental economics that shows that everybody's overconfident. We all think that we know more than we do, and we all think that we can do more than we can actually do, uh, but men are much more overconfident than women are. And so at these extremes, we are more likely to see men um, and, and this is all about socialization. As uh, somebody said before, women are socialized to take up less space, both figuratively and literally. Um, we, are, we are taught to take up less space and that includes speaking time. Okay, sorry, but, but we have still two or three questions. <laughs> and I think we can collect all, all of them and so you make a collective answer, right? Sure. Okay, so you, you had the second one very quickly. I just wanted to know about uh, policy implications. What can be done in the classroom? Uh -huh. yeah. Yes. Hello, my I'm Tobias from Austria. 
Um, I want that my question is not to you actually, but uh, more to the classroom since we we are a very international classroom. I wondered if anybody in their bachelor's in their education in another country had an experience of I don't know a better classroom participation, more equality in participation, or different strategies by professors whatsoever during their bachelor's. Yeah. Okay, we have two last questions here. Okay. Hello, um, I'm Mike from Germany. Um, I was just wondering because you, I thought your point on feminist pedagogy was interesting, and I think I like I didn't study economics before, and I had the feeling that in my gender classes that I had in my undergrad program, there was like a lot of emphasis put on like creating the safe space and like how, what you point out to like how things can be taught and that there's like different methods of doing that but i feel like i've only seen that in classes that were like more targeted at actually like just gender or feminist topics but do you feel like this is like something that is discussed within like economics departments as teachers or do you feel like that's more a thing of like i'm gonna like it's more your choice and no one's really like discussing whether to change that uh, i'm julio from mexico uh so it's very interesting that you pinpoint uh, like the pedagog the like math like how was it like pedag masculine pedagogy. Uh -huh. yeah pedagogic feminine pedagog pedagogic because I come from Mexico like the biggest university in Mexico and from my experience I feel that like now in Europe I like I feel that in Mexico it was a way more feminist pedagog pedagogy uh, so it was more like it worked like very like you had the paper you had the readings you had to make them on your own at like at your timing blah, and you would like come to the classroom to mainly discuss and the professor was more like a sort of guide yeah. uh, and that would work in like very like I was very used to that and like to be honest I didn't notice like this kind of masculine uh, like environment dominating from the economic side until I arrived to Europe. <laughs> I, I, I saw it very clearly. The professor was just like putting out knowledge, you know, like kind of also sort of, sorry for the word, but like um, kind of vomitating knowledge. Um, and the students were like very uh, like, like alone, like, um, yeah passive, passive, uh, exactly, and receivers, and basically like the, the students who would uh, rep reproduce that knowledge in a sense, reproduce the system, were the ones who were con congratulating and, and they also like the ones who have the best memory, you know, on regarding the questions, the maths, you know, and for me that has been such an, <laughs> a very crazy, weird experience, to be honest, because these in the global north in the center these are the papers that have been published and these are the 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 words that have been uh heard around the world just just that okay the floor is yours for the for the thank yeah, you please. thank you so much for these great reflections i'm i really regret i really regret my child care falling through because i'd love to sit here and talk with you but i really do hope that you all will stay in the room after I leave the screen and keep talking about this. It's so valuable. Um, okay, so briefly, Mexico versus Europe. Uh, that's so interesting. Thank you for sharing that. I think that might have to do with, in general, hierarchical structures in society. Uh, Europe, especially German speaking countries are like crazily hierarchical. Um, and I guess that's just how, as you said, we've all come up in this system. I, I grew up in the United States, so I have a different perspective. But, um, and I was shocked when I went to Austria and I was like, really, everybody's just gonna keep doing this one thing because that's what this professor did, like what? So I totally hear you and it is institutionally specific. So thanks for pointing that out. Teaching. Um, so the crazy thing about professors is that we get lots of degrees in our field of study and then we're thrown into a classroom and we're supposed to teach the stuff. And, the vast, vast, vast majority of people teaching have never taken a class or a workshop on how to teach. Yeah. That is not 
part of your training to get a PhD or your training to become a professor. Some, some universities offer it for those who want to, <laughs> but um, there's, for the most part, a, no requirement. I taught a class at the University of Vienna and uh, when I signed the contract, they were like, yeah, so, you know, uh, it's not that important. Just It just shouldn't be the worst class ever. <laughs> so like, no, there is no concern at a lot of the big research universities about teaching. What can be done? Uh, my favorite tool that I think when I heard about this, it totally literally changed my life, not just in the American, it was life changing, but it literally changed how I behave, um, is a tool called WAIT, where you ask yourself, WAIT is an acronym, why am I talking? And I don't think I have to say anything else about that. <laughs> Why am I talking? I will stop talking. Thank you so much for your reflections. I hope this was helpful. If anybody wants to write to me about the paper, I'll be glad to hear from you. Thank you very much, Lisa. Thanks for having me. And thank you, by the way, I know a lot of you are studying ecological stuff. Um, I, I just want to say, I know a lot of you are studying ecological stuff. And I just want to say thank you very much. The world needs you. So thank you for that.